Chechnya, from all over the world. In the words of one Marine officer, he said, every Al-Qaeda wanted an I was in Fallujah t-shirt. So they came flocking in. So at that point, we had a major war in Anbar province from 2004, 2005, 2006. The Sunni tribes aligned in some cases with Al-Qaeda because Al-Qaeda are Sunni. And so it was the U.S. Marines and Army, two, there are forces against two of the other forces, the Al-Qaeda and the insurgents. So we had this massive fight. Now, let me tell you how we won this thing in Anbar province, because it's important to know how we won in Iraq. Remember, you got two halves to Iraq. You got the Sunnis on the left, that's on the western Iraq, and you got mainly Shiites in eastern Iraq. We won this thing not only with fighting capability of the U.S. Marines and the Army personnel, but also the American character. Because at the same time we were fighting, we were still ambassadors for this country. And I'll give you a couple of examples. The 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, had a huge fight at Ramadi. And that's a legendary battalion, 2nd Battalion, 4th Marines, out of, out of Camp Pendleton. They killed 300 insurgents in three days in massive firefights. On the fourth day, the commander, Paul Kennedy, Lieutenant Colonel Kennedy, went to the soccer stadium in Ramadi, and he held medical open house for old people and for children. And, we, they not, and his medics, who had been working on their wounded guys the day before, inoculated kids, gave out medicine to old folks, handed out food and water. So here's the Sunni tribes who have Al-Qaeda on their side now fighting us. They're fighting the Marines and the U.S. soldiers, mostly Marines in Anbar province. And they're saying, look at these Americans. They fight fiercely. They never retreat. They're brave people, and yet when the fight is over, they come out, they build water lines for us, they inoculate kids, they pass out food and water, they build schools. The Americans are good people. Now at the same time, all these Al-Qaeda that had come in from all over the world to fight America in Iraq, and you know, the liberals were right when they said there were a lot, there weren't Al-Qaeda in Iraq before the war. That's true. They came in after the first battle of Fallujah. But the Al-Qaeda that came in, came in with a real feeling of entitlement. They told the Sunni tribes, they said, while we're here as expeditionary fighters fighting the Americans, we need temporary wives. So I'll take that one, and that one, and that one. And if the tribal leaders objected, the, the sheiks, they were killed. They taxed them at 40% for all their transactions during one period to get money for the, for the Al-Qaeda fighters to carry on a fight against the Americans. And if somebody didn't comply with their version of Muslim law, like they smoke, boy, Duncan would have a tough time there. In fact, all of them would. They're all smoking over there. If you used ice, if you didn't kneel fast enough and, and, uh, when prayer was called, you were taken to one of their phony courts and tried. And so when we came through Fallujah, we found torture houses with people in them that were mangled people weren't Americans, they were Sunnis who had done, who had, who had uh, violated Al-Qaeda's idea of Muslim law in some way. Some of them had their hands bolted together, with holes cut through their palms and a bolt on a, on a, a nut on a bolt instead of a handcuff. They had legs cut off. So Al-Qaeda started to brutalize and really intimidate and dominate the Sunni tribes. So here's the Sunni tribes say, wait a minute. We're fighting the Americans, but they're good to us. They're the ones that inoculate our kids, and they stock two billion fish in our lakes to restart our fishing industry, and they're decent to us. And yet, our so-called allies over here, Al-Qaeda, are beating up on us. So on September 6th of 2006, one brave sheep named Sitar, later killed by Al-Qaeda, had a meeting, he brought together 50 tribes, approximately 50 tribal leaders. And he said, from here on, from this day on, I fight Al-Qaeda. I'm on the side of the Americans. We, how many folks have heard the term the awakening? Remember that? That's what that was. It was really the choosing between the uh, choosing by the Sunni tribes of America over Al-Qaeda. They chose to be our allies and reverse their position. Within a few days, more tribes had joined, then more tribes. By the end of 2006, the entire war was changing. Now, i got to give you one thing on the Washington Post, and that's one thing that my book talks about. I 
talk about not only the, the guys on the ground, but what the media did and how they just served this war and the people fighting. Five days after this big turnaround in Anbar province, where our former enemy said, we're going to be on your side now and wipe out Al-Qaeda, the Washington Post never reported it. And they put out an, an article entitled, We've Lost Anbar Province. So they were always declaring defeat on the eve of victory. And yet, by the end of 2006, we were well on our way to winning in Anbar Province. Now, what happened was this, politically. Back home, the Democrats had just written the anti-war card to victory. Remember the 2006 election? Yeah. I was chairman of armed services uh, with a $500 million budget, like on November 3rd. On November 4th, I had a good view of the Capitol as a Republican, and little else. The Republicans lost the House. So the Democrats had written the anti-war card. Their, their national chairman was Howard Dean, whose trademark was anti-war in Iraq. And they were pushing George Bush to get out of Iraq. And one comparison I make in this thing is the, dif is the difference, the similarities and difference between what happened then in the fall of 2006 and what happened in Vietnam in 1974 because we were ready for a replay of 1974-75 when we lost Vietnam. Vietnam we had, we had won in 1972 when North Vietnam threw 17 divisions, every division they had against South Vietnam, and with our air power help, the South Vietnamese Army repelled them and beat them, and they fired General Giat, the main commander of the North Vietnamese forces. Then Nixon was paralyzed by Watergate. We were crushed at the polls in 1974. The Republicans were smashed. And then you had Ted Kennedy apply the finishing touch by cutting South Vietnam down by 75% of the military aid we were giving them, and they rationed their guys with 1.6 bullets a day. Russia and China saw the opening. They came in with 800,000 tons of ammo and weapons, and they rolled that supply of munitions right down Highway 1 and took South Vietnam. We were poised to lose Iraq in the fall of 2006 because the Iraq study group was coming back saying, you've got to get out of Dodge right now. You've got to leave Iraq. George Bush said, wait a minute, we're winning Anbar Province, because he was getting the reports now that all the tribes were coming over on our side. And he said, in eastern Iraq, which is a Shiite area, you got the wolf packs, you got these militias running around shooting people, and you paralyzed the government because of that, because of all of that terror and violence. Kids aren't going to school, businesses aren't open, the government's not functioning. We need more American troops, and we need them not back at big bases, we need them up close and personal in the neighborhoods in these outposts where they can, they can keep these neighborhoods peaceful so kids can go to school, businesses can operate, and the government can start to move a little bit. So January 10th, all the Democrats thought the liberal leadership, guys like Joe Biden, were sure that George Bush was going to pull a plug in Iraq after all this pressure. He'd been whipped at the polls. His poll numbers were on the ocean floor. He'd lost his majority in Congress. And they thought he was going to come out like a contrite LBJ or browbeaten Gerald Ford in 1974 and say it's over. Instead, George Bush came out and said, I'm sending five more brigades to Iraq. We're going to win. That was the surge. How many folks have heard about now, let me tell you, I've stood before this group and hammered President Bush on the fact that he wasn't as good on the border as I thought he should be, fought my fence, did other things that I didn't agree with. But you know, and people always criticize you for not being an eloquent speaker. He gave the most eloquent speech I ever heard when the liberals demanded that he leave Iraq and he used one word, he said no. <laughs> <laughs>